One short sleep past, we wake eternally and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. John Donne, who was born in 1572 and died in 1631, was an English poet and preacher whose work revolved around the ideas of faith and salvation. His poetry was celebrated at the time, but only in small circles. Now it's a major touchstone for anyone curious about the biggest questions that life poses to us. The two lines from his poem, Death Be Not Proud, attempt to answer one of those looming questions. Shall we fear death? The exhibition spans over five millennia, exploring the concept of time and eternal life, from antiquity to the modern era. This immense period is divided into three chapters, each a chronological step forward. Over the centuries, the concept of time and eternal life has attracted thinkers and artists who have looked at these themes not as insurmountable limits, but as open horizons in which the gaze of the chosen one could give explanations and perhaps exercise their destiny. The symbolism is enriched in the title of our project with the Tao symbol. The Tao sums up several meanings related to the concept of time. In Christianity, as a symbol of the cross, it is redemptive. In physics, Tao is an elementary particle. In astronomy, it is a measure of optical depth while in the theory of relativity, it symbolizes time itself. Our exhibition project aims to give voice to some concepts related to the theory of eternal life and the concept of time in art. The first chapter spans from ancient Egypt to 16th century Italy with many works generously lent by the Galleria Sabauda and the Royal Museums in Turin. An old kingdom statuary group, fourth dynasty, over two and a half thousand years before Christ, is the exhibition's earliest representation of art and eternal life. Thousands of years later, a bust of Julius Caesar and a further collection of stone and ceramic artefacts exhibited in the UK for the first time continue this theme of representations of permanence. The second chapter focuses on two remarkable artists from the 20th century, Alberto Burri and John Latham. 
and their engagement with time and landscape. In 1968, an earthquake struck the Belice Valley in Sicily and left the town of Gibellina in ruins. 20 years later, Alberto Burri unveiled this immense work of land art, Il Gran Decreto. It covered an entire hillside in monolithic slabs of concrete, preserving the memory of the landscape in all its fragmentation. Around the same time, in Scotland, John Latham was also transforming landscape into artwork. His commission to preserve monumental deposits of excess shale in the West Lovian and Mid Lovian countryside triggered a unique strand of work. Time is intrinsic to Latham's work. He developed his own philosophy of time known as event structure, proposing that the most irreducible component of reality is not the particle, but the least event. Both Latham and Burry responded to landscape and to their experiences in the Second World War by creating wounds, tearing, cutting and scorching the canvas, making it bleed. The major loan of a Bianco Cretto by the Burri Foundation offers the second room, the physical index of the spectacular Gibellina work of land art. The third chapter explores variations of the eternal that are represented in contemporary art. In this section of the exhibition, there are examples of how the values of time and eternal life are interpreted by contemporary artists. These themes have been rendered plastic in various forms and manners. We show artists who utilize both traditional materials and techniques and new materials, such as recycled objects that emphasize a continuity and a new life of the same. One of such work on exhibit is Gaetano Muratore's Time Machine, a kind of intricate and playful object that, with irony, recalls the myth of the time machine. Michel Ciocoloni's drawing Time emphasizes the importance for young artists of drawing from reality as a means to observe the true sense of life and time. Ciocoloni starts from the meticulous and precise observation of reality. She says, I use the original design as my starting point and allow these shapes to evolve into a life of their own and then continue to work on the drawing in the studio, bringing the various parts together. The dialogue continues with a work by Bruno Marcucci, Black Hole. As the critic Marcello Pecchioli says, Marcucci's is a vision in which the macrocosm recalls the microcosm, a notion apparent in all men now schools of thought, ancient and modern, from ancient mystical Greek and medieval thinking to Oriental philosophy, occult sciences, alchemy, magic, astrology. Emily Young is considered Britain's greatest living stone sculpture. Her body of work elicits a primordial, mystical, and transcendent thought of an ancient and remote memory that has no time and has not passed. It creates an antiquam, postquam dialogue with the antiquities and the eternity of time. A number of events and lectures will also enrich the project, drawing out the relationship between art and science in time and eternal life. We wanted the exhibition to start with a section dedicated to some rare and ancient antiquities, works in which, incredibly, 
we witness the reconciliation with death and exorcism through different visions. A dazzling introduction, I would say, where the forces of time and life after death are the protagonists. In fact, the exhibition will include some precious objects which carry a delicate, touching sense of humanity. Objects in which uh, the transition between life and death is seen as the natural continuation and entry into a parallel world similar to the real one. We can see this in the Roman artifacts, for example, or in the Egyptian group from the Galleria Sabauda. In this admirable group, woman is the protagonist. With a resolute gesture, she presents the consort and son to the guards. Centuries later, this highly symbolic image will still manage to speak to us in a universal language. One object that stand out in the monumental marble slab known as the Adiliana, depicting a group of dancing menads. The slab is a part of a complex funerary monument from the imperial age that no longer exists. This masterpiece fascinates us for the skill shown in the way the bodies are outlined and captured in the act of dancing and the detail in the clothing that seems to move with the dance. The itinerary continues with other important works such as the head from the funeral mask of Julius Caesar, some Roman and Punic steels, and some Etruscan and Roman urns. There is one section dedicated to interesting objects depicting small birds, companions, and the symbol of journey into the afterlife. These objects of Egyptian and Chinese origin speaks to us of everyday life immortalized in world of art. Some 16th century Italian maiolica brings the itinerary to the end, symbolically as well. These objects were used to store medicinal plants at the time, a precious aid in fighting certain diseases. Maiolica, decorated with motifs inspired by Roman and classical antiquity, that became one of the reference points and main models in the workshops of 16th, 16th century artists. Among artistic communities in 1960s Italy, there was a rumor of a British artist whose exhibitions imposed on the immediate vicinity the acrid scent of burning. After leaving the show, the odor would cling to one's clothes, leaving an invisible trail of your journey for others to follow back to the gallery. The artist was John Latham, and the exhibition was his 1963 exhibition at Bear Lane Gallery, Oxford, a space later to merge with the Museum of Modern Art, Oxford. This was Latham's first high-profile solo presentation of his work, and included this 1960 work, uh, Draw with Charred Material. Along with prior shows in continental Europe, in Brussels in 1963, Paris in 1962, and Dusseldorf in 1960, a mythos was created around this unknown British artist who burned his own art. As part of the exhibition, Time and Eternal Life, we're delighted to present a selection of assemblage works by Latham, together with the polymaterialist work of Alberto Burri. Contemporaries in different parts of Europe both of whom used the blowtorch as a medium. This room presents a dialogue of works made predominantly in the 1960s and includes later works directly influenced by these. Burry first experimented with small combustions in 1953 to 54 as illustrations for a book of poems. His first larger combustioni artwork arrived in 1957 scorching wood veneer fastened to canvas, metal sheet, and plastics. Latham almost simultaneously discovers the blowtorch with larger works arriving in 1958, prime examples of which are included in this exhibition. The two artists were wildly experimental with medium, using materials such as Celotex, such as in this 1968 Combustioni example by Burry, and as seen in Latham's um, classical painting, a use of polyurethane, and in this 1967 untitled work.
For Burry, these materials allowed an inseparable whole of form and space, bringing together of painting and sculpture. For Latham, the use of the book as a medium in particular allowed a critique on authorities of knowledge and allowed an expression of his notion that the universe is wholly constituted of time, a concept he called flat time, allied to an experimentation in form. In both artists, we can perceive a rejection of permanence in material objects and a life experienced in constant flux. Although Burry and Latham were working in the days before mass information and communication, the two artists were active internationally and we know they would have been aware of one another's work. Using, using similar techniques and materials to subtly different ends, and both relatively overshadowed in their lifetimes, the two have only more latterly received the praise they deserve. This presentation brings these two great artists together in close dialogue, allowing future generations to reflect and consider the zeitgeist of the 1950s and 60s, which allowed these modes of working to come into existence. You might think that the final part of this exhibition would be oriented towards the future, towards the modern technologically ambitious visions of life beyond the present day. And to an extent, you'd be right. There is, for example, the incredibly playful and intricate time machine by Gaetano Moratore, which is almost a cross between a mad professor's retro gadget display and a jumbo box of Lego. There's also J. Rim Lee's burial suit, the only artwork in the room which can be put on and worn as a fully functioning object available for purchase as a biodegradable coffin, an eco-friendly an eco green funeral option. And while the works in this room do project themselves into a futuristic world, they're really grounded in today. The burial suit in particular is literally designed to crumble into the soil and become part of the earth itself. That, I think, is a really interesting aspect of this final chapter. It's double vision, looking both forwards and backwards. Emily Young's sculptures embody that double vision in an amazing way. As soon as you step into the room, you can sense the strength and weight of her works. They have a kind of gravity that makes them impossible to ignore and, in their monolithic size, almost impossible to destroy. You feel very conscious standing beside them that these stone forms will outlast us. Most of their appearance is determined by ancient geological processes. Young's carving is only the most recent brief phase in an immense continuum. So, while they look forward in their stability and longevity to the future, the entire room is embedded in the past, a past which is just as ancient, arguably more ancient, than the very first room filled with antique funerary sculpture. The Sir Dennis Mann Foundation was created by Sir Dennis in his lifetime. It aims to continue his philanthropic work his art historical research, and his passionate promotion of young scholars, students, and artists. It organizes exhibitions, promotes his art collection, and lifelong work and studies to the general public. Recent projects include a donation and loan to the Bose Museum for their exhibition, The Power and the Virtue, Guido Greni's Death of Lucrezia, shown at the beginning of 2020 financially supporting the restoration of a painting at the Foundling Museum, a donation to the Pinacoteca di Cento following the earthquake in 2012, and sponsoring a Guaccino lecture for the restoration of the fresco ceiling painted by Guaccino at Piacenza Cathedral. The foundation co-sponsored the publication of a revised edition of Salerno's monograph on the paintings of Guaccino by Nicholas Turner, sponsored a Baroque Masterpieces exhibition in the Diocese of Navarra, made donations to the Art Fund for the London University Student Art Pass, for the purchase of the Van Dyck self-portrait, for a catalogue of Baroque and late Baroque art by the University of Oxford, and for the recent purchase of a major painting for the National Gallery of London. We also work with museums and galleries and promote cultural events and exhibitions. In January this year, we collaborated with Flat Time House in an exhibition, William Blake at Flat Time House. 
Our previous exhibition, Visions and Visionaries, in collaboration with the Bologna-based association Age of Future, Flat Time House and Richard Saltoon Gallery, was shown at the Guildhall Art Gallery in London, 2018 to 19. This exhibition created a narrative of the visionary movement from the artists who laid the foundations of the genre to the avant-garde generation and contemporary artists who drew from these works and were inspired to find new forms of their art. In the summer of 2019, Visionaries and the Art of Performance was shown at the Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, Italy. In 2018, together with the Museum of the Order of St. John, we organised the exhibition Techno Medievo Age of Future Reloaded and a study day, the language and meaning of time in art and science, with Age of Future and young academics from the universities of Bologna, Imperial College and Cambridge. The funding and placement of Sir Dennis's archive and library at the National Gallery of Ireland remains a major ongoing project for the Foundation. The Foundation also endows two annual prizes for young scholars and artists. The Essay Prize for young scholars to write on the periods of art that Sir Dennis studied or on subjects that he was interested in. The winning essay is presented at a renowned British or European institution. The Sir Dennis Mann Award at the Royal Drawing School gives the opportunity to continue to focus on drawing from observation and to develop the student's work towards a studio space for the duration of the year, as well as a solo exhibition. This year, we inaugurated at City and Guilds of London Art School, the Sir Dennis Mann Sculptural Project Grant, another initiative to honour his memory. Our exhibition, Time and Eternal Life at Cromwell Place is now scheduled for the autumn winter of 2020. The exhibition spans over five millennia, exploring the concept of time and of eternal life from antiquity to the modern era. The trustees are grateful to our partners and lenders for their support. Our grateful thanks goes to Bowman Sculpture, the Bury Foundation, Listen Gallery, the John Latham Foundation and Flat Time House, Roberland and Voena, the Royal Museums in Turin, the private lenders, and all the artists who have made the exhibition possible by kindly lending their extraordinary works. We are grateful to our host, Cromwell Place. This new art space in South Kensington will be inaugurated at the same time as our exhibition, Time and Eternal Life. In the spirit of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, we and Cromwell Place very much hope to capture the public imagination and interest in the connection between science and art. <laughs>